know about you, um, but I hate to wait. It's kind of a debilitating thing for me. It's probably the primary battleground of my own sanctification. One of the primary areas that the Lord is dealing uh, uh, with me in is this concept of waiting. I hate to wait in traffic. I hate to wait at the grocery store. I hate to wait at the movie theater. I hate to wait for my food to ding in the microwave. <laughs> we have these devices now that shorten the wait and I still hate to wait. I'm looking at the little timer go down and I think these seconds seem off. There's something wrong with the clock on this device. Um, I'm the guy who like um, going to the restaurant, I hate to wait for our table. Um, once I'm at the table, I hate to wait for the server to come. Once I put my order in, I hate to wait for the food to arrive. And then, if you can believe this, maybe if you're like me, after you're done eating, I hate to wait for the check. Anyone feel like that? It's like, you're so eager to get in there and sit down, and then like, you can't wait to leave. I just got to get out of this place. You're so eager to get in. That's me. I hate to wait to be in there, and then I hate to wait to leave. I have a waiting problem, but the problem is waiting is just an essential part of life. In fact, psychologists, if you believe those jokers, they say... <laughs> That the ability to delay gratification is a mark of maturity. Like, well, nah, well, maybe. <laughs> but they've done some studies on this, and, and um, maybe you've heard of the Stanford Marshmallow experiment. It's somewhat um, similar. Maybe you've heard of the Stanford Prison experiment. It's very similar to the Stanford Prison experiment, the Stanford Marshmallow experiment. What they did was these psychologists, they put these children alone in a room, and they seat them at a table, and they put right in front of them a single marshmallow. And they say, uh, you can have this marshmallow now if you want it. And anytime you can eat this marshmallow. But if you wait, if you wait until I return, if you wait till the grown-up comes back, then you could have two marshmallows. Right? You can have this one now, but if you wait, you can have two. And then they leave the room and turn the cameras on. And I've seen some of this footage. These kids, like, they're, they're squirming. They're fidgeting. You can feel the, the existential angst. It's just emanating from their bodies. One kid, there was like a cup in the room and one little boy, he took the cup and he covered up the marshmallow. <laughs> I was like, if I, if I don't have to see it, then I won't be tempted. The, the pain will not be as great. They stare at it. They, they can't conceive of a second marshmallow when this one is right there. Well, in the end, what they discovered was actually only one third of the subjects waited for the second marshmallow. Two thirds had to have the marshmallow right in front of them as soon as they could. We hate to wait. But as I said, waiting is not just an essential part of life, it's, it's actually an essential part of the Christian life. Waiting is embedded in the hope of Christianity. Just think of things like the fruit of the Spirit and the concepts of spiritual discipline, things like self control, things like patience and peace. Those are all connected to the concept of waiting. Well, the agony of waiting, just that, that, that sense of I need deliverance now, I need results now, I need an answer now, that agony, that desperation is embedded in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. There are multiple weights, there are multiple senses of, of urgency and of despair. And what we learn primarily is that there is no wait too long for the Lord who is always on time. And there is no wait too long for the Lord's children who are never truly in danger. The scene begins. Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, verse 21. A great crowd gathered about him. And he's beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet. And he implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And the great crowd followed him and, and, and uh, uh, pressed in around him. And there was a woman, verse 25 begins. It's an interruption. Now both Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel, which show us this same scene, show this narrative in the same way. So this isn't sort of a literary invention by Mark in his account. This is how it happened. There's an interruption in the middle. But there's something unique about Mark's account of this story. If you know anything about the four Gospels in particular, you probably know that Mark's Gospel is not just the briefest Gospel, the shortest, it's also the most quickly paced. Mark is in a hurry. He's constantly moving. In fact, the word immediately appears numerous times through the whole book. He's constantly using the word immediately, and we'll even see that in our passage this morning. Mark is like um, 
He doesn't have a birth narrative like Matthew and Luke do. He doesn't have an extended prologue like, like John's gospel does. He just immediately hits into the action. And then he's at this sort of breathless pace towards the cross and resurrection. Now, Mark's gospel, which is so quickly paced and is moving so fast and has this heightened sense of, of dramatic urgency of action taking place, it's actually Mark's gospel, though, that presents this account in its um, uh, uh, longest length. His version of this story is the longest out of the three gospels that show this story. Isn't that interesting? Why would Mark, who's always in a hurry, slow down? to tell us this story? Well, I think it might be because Mark is trying to show us how Jesus would often slow down for an important event or for an event he deemed important even if others would not. Jesus is in fact a master at the ministry of interruption. He's showing us what a lot of pastors have had to learn just by experience. We are tempted sometimes to see interruptions to our agenda as impediments to the ministry, when in fact the interruptions are the ministry. Now this woman had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. 12 years she is suffering from this. Do you think maybe she was tired of waiting? Maybe she was tired of waiting year one. 12 years she's experienced this. Verse 26 tells us she had suffered much under many physicians and she spent all her money and she was no better but rather grew worse. Now we don't know exactly what the discharge of blood is. We don't know the details, the specifics of what this particular ailment is but we do know a couple of things. The first is that she's suffering for a very long time and nobody could help her. And in fact, the people who are uh, tasked with helping her, the people she's paying to help her, the people who are trained to help her actually make it worse. So the longer she's gone with this illness, the more suffering, the more pain, the more shame she has endured. But we also know this. In the Jewish religion and in this culture, a discharge of blood makes someone ritually unclean. So she is in effect considered an untouchable person. Not just someone who is in pain. Not just someone who is suffering. But someone who is considered like human garbage. Leviticus chapter 15 verse 25 says, If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. And so she has lived in this pain, this anguish, this shame, personally, emotionally, spiritually, culturally, and religiously for over a decade. And now she's destitute. She's spent all of her money and all of her time trying to solve a problem that's only become worse. I want you to think about maybe a a parallel for your own life. Maybe your own situation is not this dire, but maybe it is. Maybe you've waited a very long time for some problem, some concern, maybe an illness of some kind to go away, to end. Maybe you've asked God, couldn't I just be done with this? Haven't I learned the lesson? Whatever it is you're teaching me, I think I get it. I'm ready to be out from under this, Lord. How long do I have to deal with this? Maybe it's something a little more emotional. Maybe it's not something necessarily physical. Maybe you're tired of of existing in a kind of failure while you feel like everyone else around you succeeds or existing in a kind of lack while everyone else seems to have a kind of abundance. Or maybe you feel overlooked or unnoticed or unrecognized while the people around you seem to have uh, acclaim and success. Maybe you're beginning to wonder if waiting even makes any sense anymore. Maybe waiting with any kind of hope. Maybe your illness isn't physical, it's hard to see. Maybe you struggle with depression or anxiety. And you just long to have that just just kind of sucked out of your body. If you could just be done with it. Especially because people just don't seem to understand that. They don't get it. And so you almost feel alone even in that kind of pressure. Maybe there's a kind of justice that you're waiting for. And it really just seems too long delayed. One of the ironic encouragements I think that we find in the scriptures is this recurring phrase we see, especially in the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms and from the prophets. It's a question to God. It's this um, 
question that says, How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? I find that oddly encouraging that the Bible would actually affirm the cry of the human heart that we are weary in the waiting. How long do we have to endure this? When will there be peace? Well, I don't know what your particular situation is or what your particular grief is, but here's what I do know. It's the first thing that we learn from this passage. You are not so hopeless that you'll be forgotten. You are not so hopeless that you'll be forgotten. Maybe you think Jesus only cares about the important people. Like theologically, I know you don't think that. Academically, I know you don't think that. But situationally, right, circumstantially, sometimes it feels that way, doesn't it? If only because maybe the people around us seem to act that way. They only care about the important people, the people who have something to offer. A Jairus is a ruler. He's an important man. And he comes to an important man and he addresses him directly. He comes straight to Jesus. But Jesus still makes time for this unclean, untouchable woman. Imagine if her 12 years of waiting had culminated in this encounter, only to see Jesus just kind of walk out of reach. Her last thread of hope now unravel. Or imagine, perhaps worse, she's come to Jesus for this healing and he turns and rebukes her. She's got to feel almost beyond hope by now. And she has likely mustered up every ounce of hope and faith that she's got just to make that reach. And she discovers that even she is not outside the scope of Christ's redemption. In fact, nobody really is, provided they want it from him. And we see the same truth over and over again with who Jesus is spending time with. Jesus is prioritizing people in the margins, people on the outskirts of polite society, people outside the spectrum of acceptable decorum, the ones that you're not supposed to spend time with. Jesus is actually prioritizing. He, they're the ones he's most motivated to spend time with. We see it in the way he welcomes both women of ill repute and little children who have nothing to offer him. Brothers and sisters, when you tug... On Jesus' garment, he doesn't sigh or roll his eyes. He loves to be pestered. Pester him. Matthew 19, 30 says, But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. But 12 years is a long time, isn't it? It's a long time. I think of the man by the pool of uh, Bethsaida. Do you remember that man? He was paralyzed. 38 years. 38 years. He laid by that pool, just dying to get into that water that would allegedly heal him, while people stepped over him for years to get their own healing. 38 years. And when the Lord shows up, finally, on that climactic day, John's gospel tells us instantly the man got well. There are no little people in the kingdom of God. I wonder if this woman felt the wait was worth it. 12 years. How long have you been waiting? Whatever it is that you're waiting for, whatever has come to mind, the healing, deliverance, success, an answer, whatever it is, how long have you been wondering if, if, if the Lord cares, if he loves you, if somehow you maybe slipped through the cracks, like maybe he's forgotten you, maybe he's got more important things to do. Well, the God of the universe is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. And you might be at the end of your rope, but that is where most people discover that Jesus is more than enough. Maybe you've heard the uh, saying that when, when God closes a door, he opens a window. You ever heard that? It's not a Bible verse, by the way. <laughs> and I suppose it's true that sometimes when God closes a door, he opens a window. But a lot of times when God closes a door, it's because he wants you inside when the building collapses. The real question is, is Christ enough? Is Christ enough? And I'm here to tell you that you are not so hopeless that you'll be forgotten. The Lord sees, the Lord knows. Secondly, you're not so weak that you'll be forsaken. You're not so weak that you'll be forsaken. 
Verse 22, Jairus comes when he sees Jesus, he falls at his feet, which is interesting because earlier in the chapter, in verse 6, for instance, the, the scene before our scene, the demoniac does the same thing, falls down at the feet of Jesus. Falling down at the feet of Jesus seems to be an essential part of faith. And he implores him earnestly, verse 23, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. He calls her my little daughter. Later we learn that she's 12 years old. She's actually not very little anymore. And actually in, in this culture, a 12-year-old is practically considered a, a grown-up. Like they didn't have the concept of teenagers back then. A 12-year-old is considered almost a grown-up, a young woman. But if you're a dad, particularly a dad of daughters, she could be 43, right? And she's still your little girl. That's what's really happening here. It's a, a term of endearment, my little daughter, that shows his affection for her. And it's echoed by Jesus later. There's a sense of urgency here. Jairus, as a ruler in the synagogue, he might be at the end of his rope. This might be his last hope. We could deduce that based on a couple of things. Number one, he's come at the point of death of his daughter. Like she is very near death. Why wouldn't he come to Jesus sooner? So this must be his, his last hope, his last ditch effort. We could also assume that maybe based on Jesus' interactions with religious leaders. Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue. And he might be thinking, you know, I see the way Jesus talks to people like me. He seems to have his harshest words for religious leaders. Maybe he won't want to help me. Or maybe Jairus himself doesn't like Jesus. But for whatever reason, he realizes Jesus is his only hope in this moment. So he comes and he falls at Jesus' feet and he begs him and he's desperate. And then as Jesus goes to help him, there's this interruption. This woman, verse 27, she'd heard the reports about Jesus. And she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel are actually more specific. It's the fringe of his garment, the tassel on his garment. For she said, verse 28, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, and first of all, isn't that kind of cool? It's kind of awesome. Like, whoa, I felt power coming out. I mean, I don't know how that works, but I just like that. I mean, it's just a dude thing. I don't know. It just seems cool. Like, wow. Yeah. Anyway. Power goes out of him. Immediately, he turns about in the crowd and he says, who touched my garments? Now, this is interesting because it raises the question for me. Does Jesus not know? Does he not know? This could be a, an instance of um, what we might call a divine self-limitation. There are two wills in Jesus because he's fully God and fully man. We have a, maybe one other example of, of, of such a thing in terms of knowledge where he says even the son does not know the day or the hour of, the, of his return. So maybe it's a divine self-limitation. It could be that. But I think this is something else. I actually think this is an echo of Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. You remember where Adam and Eve are hiding. They've just sinned. And the Lord comes walking in the garden. And he says, where are you? Did he not know? He knew exactly where they were. And I think he's doing a very similar thing here. He's trying to set up a reckoning. He's trying to set up a, a scene, a moment. He's orchestrating a moment that will provoke faith in the woman. His disciples say to him, verse 31, you see the crowd? What are you talking about? There's, everyone's pressing in on you. This is crowded, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looks around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, and she falls down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, you piece of trash. <laughs> if you don't have your Bible open, you're like, I don't remember Jesus saying <laughs> No, it's a, a, amazing what it does. He didn't even say woman. What does he say? Daughter. Daughter. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Mark is showing us here. Actually, Jesus is showing us here. Two portraits of faith. 
One is kind of embedded in the other. There's a portrait of faith of Jairus and there's a portrait of faith this woman. There's some part of this story that indicates that this woman isn't entirely trusting. Her faith isn't very strong. How do we know that? Well, she's probably thinking, if I show myself to him, undoubtedly he'll reject me. I'm, I'm ritually unclean, and he's the Holy One of Israel. If, if, if anyone should resist touching me, it would be the Holy One of Israel. The holiest man who ever lived, surely he, among all men, wouldn't touch me. So she knows that Jesus can heal her. She's not sure if he would want to. And yet the love Jesus shows her, even when she's tried to, in a sense, steal the blessing from him, certainly shows his interest in her. You are not so weak that you will be forsaken. The Bible says to cast all of your cares onto him because he cares for you. Two portraits of faith. Jairus comes fully convinced. He's in a moment of desperation, but he approaches Jesus directly, speaks to him man to man. The woman tries stealth. And when confronted, she's full of fear and trembling. And yet he calls her daughter. What does this tell us? This tells us something really important theologically, actually. Because in these two portraits, you have a, a, a weak faith and you have a strong faith. And what we see is that both a weak faith and a strong faith receive the same measure of grace. Both receive healing. This tells us, brothers and sisters, that you don't need a strong faith. Just a real faith. You don't need a strong faith because we have a strong Savior. And it's not the strength of the faith that saves, it's the strength of the Savior. And even a weak faith, a little faith. Jesus said you could have faith the size of a mustard seed. If it's real, a, a beat down, battered, minuscule faith can lay hold of all of the riches of grace that are in Christ Jesus. You are not so weak that you'll be forsaken. There's time even for you. And maybe Jairus knows this. I, I don't know. I would love to kind of be inside his head in this moment. I picture him in this moment. He's come to Jesus out of urgency. Jesus urgently turns to go with them. Then they're interrupted. Is, G, is, is Jairus standing there waiting patiently or impatiently? This woman's waited 12 years. Maybe she could wait another 15 minutes, another day. My daughter's dying now. I need help now. As far as we know, he says nothing, but I have to imagine him just sort of, his fear is swelling. This is urgent, and Jesus stops and slows down, and he's got to be thinking, come on, come on, come on. I mean, this one, she's untouchable. She's, you're going to stop for her? All right, okay. I, just the anxiety, the desperation has got to be increasing, and then... And then his worst fears come true. While he was still speaking, verse 35, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear. Only believe. You know, that command, don't be afraid, is the most frequent command in all of Scripture. It's the most commonly repeated command in all of Scripture. Not love God or love your neighbor. That's the most important command. It's a great commandment. But the most frequent command is don't be afraid. What does that tell us, do you think? I, I don't know what Jairus is thinking this whole time. He's issued no objection, but surely his anxiety is growing. And now what he feared could happen has happened. But Jesus has a word for that. Don't be afraid. When Christ is involved, the worst case scenario is never as bad as it seems. In fact, thirdly and finally, you are not so sick that you can't be healed. You are not so sick that you can't be healed. 
He allowed no one to follow him, verse 37, except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus saw commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Matthew in his gospel tells us that the professional mourners have shown up, the flute players and all that sort of thing. In verse 39, and when he entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. No, wait, what? No, Jesus, did, didn't you hear? She's dead. It's, it's too late. It's too late. Didn't you hear the news? It's too late. This is a reminder to us what happens next. That we ought not to set our sights so low. Because despite what the world thinks, there are worse things than dying. Like, the world thinks that the worst thing that can happen to you is to die. But that's not the worst thing that can happen to you. Dying's not the worst thing that can happen to you. Dying after you die is the worst thing that can happen to you. Because Jesus is Lord over life and death, the death of our bodies is no hindrance to him. This is a concept lost sometimes even in the church which has forgotten that the blessed hope is not simply going to heaven when we die, but receiving an imperishable body at the resurrection to come. Every resurrection, in fact, in the scriptures is a picture, a foreshadow of that moment when Christ returns and we who are dead in Christ will rise and have resurrection bodies to enjoy new heavens and a new earth. If Christ's work is true, we have to radically reevaluate our conception of death. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, yes. And if we are in Christ, there is nothing he will take from us that he will not give back to us in the age to come. A millionfold. You're going to say, believe it or not, I don't know how you feel right now, and you may be feeling like this is not worth it. In the end, weak faith or not, when you get there, you're going to say, it was worth it. It was worth it. For the faithful, this is comfort. But for the worldly, this is just complete foolishness. We are out of our minds to believe this stuff. They laughed at him, verse 40. They laughed at him, but he put them all outside. And I love that. I don't know how he did it, but I'm picturing Jesus just kicking and strong arming, grabbing guys by the coat and throwing them out the door. That's the Jesus I know. <laughs> he put them all outside. And then he takes gently the child's father and mother by the hand and those who were with him, and he went in where the child was, and then he takes her by the hand, and he says to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. Talitha Kumi, um, little girl. So Jesus is echoing here the father's affection. Talitha is a term of endearment. Literally, it just means little girl. That's the literal translation of it, little girl. But in this vernacular, and you know, the connotation then would be very much like today our word sweetie or honey. It's, it's a term of endearment. So do you see what Jesus is doing here? The girl has died, but because he is Jesus the Lord, God incarnate in the flesh, sovereign over life and death, the head of all rule and authority, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the sustainer of the universe by just a word from his lips, he's treating her like it's time to get up and eat breakfast and get ready for school. Sweetie, it's time to get up. Verse 42, and immediately the girl got up and she began walking for she's 12 years of age and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Well, I should say so. <laughs> My wife Becky and I have two daughters who are living. They, they are in uh, Pennsylvania away at college. But we have a, a third daughter, actually it was our second daughter between them who, who passed. Our second child, I, re I remember the signs that something was wrong. Um, I remember going to the hospital. We were actually visiting family over the uh, July 4th holiday in Houston. And we found ourselves in this dark little room at the hospital with a technician with a little instrument scanning my wife's belly to look for signs of life inside. And I just remember the darkness of the room just really kind of mirrored the, just how spiritually dark it felt. We just, they hadn't told us anything definitive, but we just, we just felt this is, this is bad news coming. 
And it only got worse as the doctor came in and the technician has like said nothing to us, nothing encouraging or discouraging, but just the silence we could kind of tell. And then when the doctor came in and they're talking to each other in whispers and just reality is beginning to set in, the bad news is beginning to set in. Later the doctor did confirm that we had lost our child, miscarriage. And the shock of course is just profound. It just couldn't think, I couldn't really even feel in the moment. And we were sitting in this examination room, having heard this news, preparing to leave actually. And this male nurse came in and he made some kind of joke. And I don't even remember what the joke was, but it was some kind of attempt at humor. And then because we didn't respond for obvious reasons, he made another joke about how we were a tough crowd or it was a tough room or something like that because we didn't laugh at his his joke. And I'd like to think, you know, that he just didn't know what had happened. He didn't know what room he was walking into or what we, had, what, you know, the news that we had just heard. You know, thinking charitably, maybe he just had no idea. Or maybe he thought this would lighten the mood in some way, that this was a kind of word of comfort to have a kind of, you know, word of humor or something like that. And in any event, it just, to me, it felt like death itself was mocking us, laughing at us. Whatever his motivation, whatever his reason, ignorance, naivete, just a bad bedside manner, I don't know. I just found it so callous. If I'd had the energy, I would have really, you know, let him have it. But instead, I just, internally, I just felt like, I felt hated. I don't know, not my God, but just the world, the, the curse, death, death was mocking of course, our, our, our shock eventually gave way to just shock waves of grief and just the deluge of grief. And later, we decided we would name our, our baby Angel. Not because we think, you know, when someone dies, they become an angel in heaven, but just this is our baby in, in heaven. So we're going to call her Angel. A, a year later, Becky was pregnant again, and the pregnancy was really difficult. There was stress and other factors that were complicating our baby's growth and and Beck was in a lot of discomfort and anxiety. Uh, the, the doctor ordered, in fact, that she should work from home. And, um, and it was just, you know, after the miscarriage, we, just, we were just so nervous about the whole thing. Just very fearful. That daughter, our daughter was, was carried all the way to term. I remember the birth, though. It was, it was a, a very nerve-wracking moment and fearful moment because when she was born, and, um, there wasn't any noise. She didn't cry, it wasn't, and she wasn't breathing. And I could see the look on the nurse's face that she looked concerned. And that made me think, oh no, like of their concern. And so I began to panic and I began to think, God, you cannot do this to us again. Especially in this moment, at this time. Nurse brought baby over to the little bassinet thing. Had that little, you know, squeezy thing to get rid of all the stuff in her throat. And just kind of clear out. And I just stood there and prayed. Dear Lord, please, please, please. And the moment of silence was finally ended with the most beautiful wail, this cry that I had ever heard in my life. We named that baby Grace. And she was born actually on July 5th, exactly one year and one day from the passing of Angel. Her due date was actually July 4th. She was going to be due on the day that Angel had passed. But we learned our grace has a timing of her own. And she still does. She makes us wait for everything. <laughs> Sweetie, it's time to go to school. Uh, 20 minutes. I'll be, I'll be right there. And we have learned that God's grace has a timing of its own too. He's never late, church. He's never late. In my retrospective fantasies, in my imagination, Jesus comes into that somber examination room and took that moron nurse by the arm and puts him outside. <laughs> there will come a day when those who mock the faithful for their belief, who jeer at them for both their grief and their hope, they're going to get their comeuppance. If it seems to take too long, do not doubt it is coming. The church will not suffer the derision of the world one second longer than God has planned. And in a splendid vision of exulting triumph, the Lord will put away the drawing and the sneering. He's going to put it outside. 
And he's going to take his children by the hand and he's going to deliver them. And he's going to say to death itself, it's over. Time's up. You're done. Taking her by the hand, he says to her, Talitha Kumi, little girl, I say to you, get up. All of the grief, all of the pain, all of the fear, all of the weight of the entire broken mess of life brought down to the finest point of a hush in the gentle words, it's time to get up, honey. Like the wild storm immediately calming at his command, Jesus instantaneously will make death stop. God's given us two beautiful, growing daughters. They are the light and joy of my life. I like to picture Angel having a smile like her mom's, blue eyes like her mom's, a little thin wisp of a hand, maybe. And maybe Jesus will grant to me this sort of fantasy in, in our reunion, that when my life on this earth is done, whenever that is, it could be today, it could be a long time from now, when I wake up to the wonder of his glorious might and his all-consuming presence, perhaps he will grant me the privilege of angel being at my side, her hand holding mine, saying sweetly in a heavenly tongue, it's time to get up, daddy. It's time to get up. Maybe your experience of the Christian life is one in which you don't feel fully embraced by Jesus. Maybe you think in some way he's obligated himself to you. For a long time in my Christian life, I just felt like I exploited some kind of loophole, right? Like God loves me, but he don't really like me. He loves me because he has to. Well, in a way that's true, but not in the way most people think. Look, he, he owes you nothing. He owes you nothing, which means it's a huge deal that he loves you, that he actually truly loves you and likes you. He likes the you that he is planning for you to be. And you may not be healed of physical affliction this side of the veil. Nobody can promise you that. You might be. We, we pray for that. We believe that the Lord can heal. But we're not promised that this side of heaven. But if you're in Christ, you will be healed of physical uh, affliction in eternity. The bleeding woman and, Jir and, and Jairus' daughter both had to die eventually. Ever think about that? Everyone Jesus raised had to die again. <laughs> it's a reminder not to set our sights too low. Because what really ails us and what will really kill us is the sin that separates us from a holy God. And the reason Christ has come is not primarily to make sick people well, but to make dead people live. And the death that is the wages of sin is far worse than the death that is the wages of a broken world. And yet Christ can heal us from even that. That's why he's come, to heal us from death itself. There is no sin too great for his grace. His sacrifice on the cross is sufficient for you. His blood is more than enough for your pardon. Your greatest disease is your sin, but Christ's cross and resurrection are proof that you are not so sick that you can't be healed. And one thing we learn from this interruption is that on the way to resurrection, our salvation is part of the story. On his way to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, Jesus heals the woman and makes her part of the story. And that little narrative is kind of a micro picture of the bigger story. Jesus is on his way to die and rise again. That is the mission. But along the way, he's teaching and he's healing and he's exercising demons. And he's eating and he's sleeping and he's welcoming and he's worshiping and he's laughing. He has a plan and he's going to get there right on time. He'll get there at the right time. But in the meantime, there is time. And all who desire his touch will get it. So long as we are rushing headlong toward the second coming of Christ, there is time enough for the salvation of all who trust in him. He's not slow, he's patient. This is how Peter puts it in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Your healing from disability or illness or just from the ordinary pains of a broken world may not come for a long, long time. But your healing from sin can be a part of the story now. If you'll come and get it this very morning. And those of you who are redeemed by the blood of Christ 
and yet you still suffer from some kind of ailment. Maybe you feel forgotten in the waiting. Remember, he will never leave you or forsake you. Even if you die, yet will you live. And all who believe in him, he promised, will never die. The love of Christ is so deep, there is more than enough for you if you want it. The question for you this morning is, do you want it? Do you want it? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the gift of your grace. We know that we can't believe this stuff apart from your Holy Spirit and the power of your grace. We ask that you would bring that to bear on the hearts and souls of everyone gathered here this morning. Father, for every saint in this room, every brother and sister who has repented of their sin and put their faith in your son, Christ Jesus, I pray you would strengthen their faith. We know we have the strength of Christ even with a weak faith, but we ask that you would strengthen our faith. Renew our hope. Give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear how good you are. Give us the taste buds, the spiritual taste buds to, to, to taste and see that you are good, that you are faithful. And Father, for those in the room who have not put their faith in your son, maybe they know they're not a believer. They're here for whatever reason. They're seeking. Someone invited them. They're just checking things out. Maybe they think they're a believer because they do the religious thing. I pray that you would awaken them, awaken their soul to see how your son, his cross and resurrection are the greatest hope of the world and bring them even this very morning from death into life. We know that you can do that. We ask that you would for the glory of your son. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen.